7, and it can be found on page 1205, beginning at verse 1. So this is Hebrews chapter 7. And it's quite a long chapter. <laughs> Melchizedek the priest. This Melchizedek was king of Salem, that's Jerusalem, and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi, who become priests, to collect a tenth from the people, that is, their brothers, even though their brothers are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by men who die, but in the other case, by, men who is, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collected the tenth, Paid, paid the tent through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Jesus like Melchizedek. If perfection could have been attained through the Levit Levitical priesthood, from the basis of it the law was given to the people, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. For of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears one who has become a priest, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are priests forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the Lord made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now there have been many of, of those priests since death presented them from continuing office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appointed as high priests men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let us just um, share a word of prayer. 
Holy Spirit, cause the entrance of your word to give us light and understanding. Amen. I captioned this Jesus like Melchizedek. And you can also say the priesthood of Jesus. I came from a country, Nigeria, and um, interestingly, when people engage with me or meet me for the very first time, um, what uh, the conversation goes this way, you know, uh, it's more around jollof rice, corruption in Nigeria, and that kind of thing. Um, but interestingly, recently I met a young man who just went straight to, instead of, you know, bringing about the discussion around jollof rice, you know, he goes, why is it that churches in Nigeria, you know, are always about money, money, money? And I, I just retorted. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, but I am from the Anglican uh, uh, background, I'm from the Church of um, England. And um, in the Anglican communion, we do not talk about money. We talk more around uh, Jesus Christ. So it's Jesus that the focus is on today. So don't, don't just be scared. Don't think that because I'm a Nigerian, I'm going to talk about the money part of Hebrews chapter 7. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to focus on Jesus our Savior. That's what my focus will be on today. Um, I'm sure we have all had um, a time when we met someone uh, for the very first time. Uh, some first time uh, ex encounters leave very lasting uh, memory. Some are pleasant memories, while some encounters leave very unpleasant memory. With resol resolutions like, I never wish to see that person again. Interestingly, the encounter between Abraham and Melchizedek seems to be one which positively impacted on Abraham. So much so that he decides to part with 10% of the spoil from the coalition of five kings he defeated uh, to rescue Lot, his brother. I would like you to picture an encounter with a total stranger that compelled you to part with money. I'm not referring to the occasional handout to um, a beggar on the street. I'm talking about a random fellow who had no need of your money. But having made acquaintance, you decided to offer him something of value. To me, that is very rare. And this compels me to ask the question, who exactly is Melchizedek? The etymologies, king of righteousness and king of peace, were believed to evoke traditional messianic attributes by first century Jewish interpreters. In other words, he was considered some sort of savior. Again, this compels me to ask the question, who was he delivering, or who was he saving? However, scripture did not go further to elaborate on these attributes of his messianic qualities. We also had no clue of his ancestry, birth or death, hence the befitting description of his eternal priesthood. Bible scholars believe that speculation on Melchizedek was riff in the period and that some persons believed he was an angelic judge, while others used him to symbolize the divine word. As a matter of fact, Gnostic Christians were convinced he was an angel. Please note the suggestion in Hebrews 7 verse 4, that Melchizedek is superior to the Levitical priests, as it asserts that Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek, and that was in Genesis 14.20. And since in verse 5 of Numbers 18.21 to 32, the Israelites were required to pay a tithe to the Levitical priests, 
who are descendants of Abraham, who having no biological relationship with Melchizedek, paid a tithe to him, thereby establishing a hierarchy that suggests Melchizedek is superior to Abraham, and Abraham is superior to the Levitical priests, as well as Levi. Another point of note is that Melchizedek blessed Abraham, who had received the promise. This statement was quickly followed by another in verse 7. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. Interestingly, uh, biblical evidence suggests that this is not always the case, uh, as we could see in uh, 2 Samuel 14.22, where Joab blessed King David, and not David blessing Joab. Joab is in, was inferior. He was the commander of David, but he blessed David, and David didn't bless Joab. Another point of note is the poser around the effectiveness of the Levitical priesthood in the perfection of humanity, as seen in verse 11 of Hebrews 7. It is apparent that the Levitical priesthood could not guarantee us the forgiveness of sins and the ability to partic uh, participate in the covenant community. Because if the Levitical priesthood had produced the required perfection, Psalm 110 verse 4 would not have predicted another priesthood. Also note the parenthetical comment which connects the priesthood with the law in verse 12. Although this parenthesis seems to be a casual aside, the connection is very significant and critical to the foundation of a new law because it aptly notes that if the priestly basis of the law is eliminated, then the law itself becomes invalid. In my previous incarnation as a lawyer, we have so many definitions for law. We define law as the command of the sovereign backed by sanction. Note the sovereign, an institution. We also define law as what the judge says is the law. The judge, another institution. This boils down to the interpretation of a law made by parliament, which is another institution, so parliament makes a law, and that law has some complications. It's not pretty clear. And then it goes to the court, and then the judge interprets that law, and that law becomes the law. Another definition of law is a bill which passes through parliament and receives royal assent. Now, I want you to imagine a situation where the institutions that make and enforce the law are destroyed and no more in existence. Clearly, the consequence of such a situation is that the laws made by such institutions fall apart and of no effect and anarchy reigns unless a new institution emerges. That, in a nutshell, is what has happened here in Hebrews chapter 7. It became clear that perfection, which is the most critical need of man, could not be guaranteed by the Levitical priests. There was therefore the need to collapse the institution of the Levitical priests. And as soon as that institution collapses, the laws associated with it also collapsed and became of no effect. It was therefore necessary for another priest, after the order of Melchizedek, to take the center stage. It is therefore not only asserted, but proven, that the priesthood and law, having been overthrown, a new dispensation is now in place, by which true believers may be made perfect. One clear proof of the change of the priesthood and of the law is the change in the tribe from which the priesthood comes, as evident in verse 14 of Hebrews 7, because originally they normally come from the Levitical priesthood. 
Jesus Christ had nothing to do with Levi. He is from Judah, the line of Judah. A second proof is in the change, the change in the form and order of making the priests. The law by which Christ became priest is after the order of Melchizedek, which possesses the power of endless life, giving preference infinitely to Christ and the gospel. Whereas the Levitical priest died and were replaced, Jesus, the high priest of our profession, holds his office by that innate power of endless life, which he has in himself to communicate eternal life to all those who duly rely upon his sacrifice and intercession. A third proof of the change of the priesthood and of the law is the change in the efficacy of the priesthood. When a battery in our car runs its full life cycle and unable to power our car engine, what do we do? We replace it. Similarly, the Levitical priesthood became of no effect. The priests of old, like Eli, for instance, were very effective as signs and wonders followed them. We will remember the case of Anna when she prayed with Elkanah. Since the Levitical priesthood became comatose and brought nothing to perfection, it was necessary for the emergence of the priesthood of Jesus, our advocate, which bring along with it a better hope, a hope for pardon and salvation. By this hope, we as believers are encouraged to draw near unto God and to live a life of communion with him. Please note the following changes that came with the priesthood of Christ. One, there is a change in God's way of acting in this priesthood. Christ was made a priest with the oath of God. There was an oath. And the Bible says an oath is the end of all strife. There was an oath to establish the priesthood of Jesus in line with the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek. Two, there is a change in the dispensation of that covenant. As the gospel dispensation becomes more full, free, and efficacious than that of the law, because Jesus as Shoti united the divine and human nature together in his own person and therein provides an assurance of reconciliation and he has as Shoti united God and man together in the bond of the everlasting covenant. Three, there is a remarkable change in the number of the priests. In the priesthood of Aaron, there was a multitude of priests. Several people were priests alongside Aaron. It wasn't just one person. But in this priesthood of Christ, there is but one and the same, Jesus Christ. The Levitical priests for the Levitical priests could not continue their priesthood by reason of death. But Jesus, our high priest, continues forever, and his priesthood is an unchangeable one. There can be no vacancy in this priesthood. No hour or moment are the people without a priest to negotiate their spiritual concerns in heaven. This ever-living high priest is able to save to the uttermost all who come to him, to, who come to God by him. Five, there is a remarkable difference in the moral qualifications of the priests. He is such a high priest as became us, holy, harmless, and undefiled. Our case as sinners needed a high priest to make 
satisfaction and intercession for us. No priest could be suitable or sufficient for our reconciliation to God, but one who was perfectly righteous. Six, he is a blessing, just like Melchizedek blessed Abraham. He raised the dead. He healed all sorts of sicknesses. That in itself was blessing to mankind. He is still in the business of healing today. He is still in the business of saving. We have shared testimonies here. My daughter shared her experience where she was almost, you know, she was mugged. But for the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who intervened, because as believers, we believe that God is in a mission. He went ahead and, you know, provided protection. I am sure if we count our blessings from January even up to this very moment, we, each and every one of us here, will identify one thing that God has done for us in this year. In conclusion, our Lord Jesus was exactly such a high priest as we wanted. For he has a personal holiness. No sin dwells in him. Though it does in the best of Christians, he doesn't have sin. He is harmless. Never did the least wrong. He never did the least wrong to God or man. He is undefiled, though he took upon himself the guilt of our sins. Yet he never involved himself in the fact and fault of them. He is indeed separate from sinners, though he took a true human nature. Yet the miraculous way in which it was conceived set him apart and separate from all humanity. He is made higher than the heavens, for he is exalted at the right hand of God to perfect the design of his priesthood. Most importantly, he needed not to offer up himself, yet he did for our mercy, which he did not need for himself. Amen. Amen.